Am I working? Am I working? I guess I guess I'm working. So I'm not supposed to hear myself. It's just it's just okay. Good. Great. Let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is V Trong with Metrostar. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer here. And we are super excited uh, to have everybody here today um, for the first, you know, Pi Data DC meetup uh, for 2023, right? And in, in addition to that, it's our first in-person one. We've, we've, uh, we've yeah. so happy new year. No more COVID, you know, hopefully, <laughs> knock, knock. Um, but we wanted to kick off the year with a special event, um, hybrid, obviously, with everybody here and a, and a special guest as well. Um, I think we have about, I don't know, 35 or so people here. I'm just kind of guessing. Um, and uh, probably about the same online as well. So it's streaming event. So don't say anything crazy. Um, and for those that are here, food, help yourself to food and beverage throughout the event and definitely get your networking in as well. Um, so with that said, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to, to, to have uh, Travis here. In my time uh, working with Travis, you know, he's, I've never met someone so passionate about open source. And not just building open source, you know, technologies, libraries, uh, but building communities around them, right? Um, and then helping the community to use the technologies as building blocks to build you know, data science, machine learning, AI solutions. Um, and, and it's amazing. And we should be all excited that he's here today and just um, in person uh, to, to have this event. Um, also, one of the smartest people uh, I've ever met um, as well, interesting, and, and very humble. So I know we uh, had a little bit of <laughs> discussion around that. Um, but with that said, um, Want to get this started? So uh, I think everybody knows Wilson from previous Pi Data DC meetups. So Wilson, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. All right. Well, All right. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out in person and/or virtually, and Travis for coming out as well. Um, for anyone who's new to Pi Data DC, I'm Wilson, uh, senior data scientist with MetroStar, and um, I've been hosting uh, the Pi Data meetups for a little bit now. Um, specialties around computer vision and uh, general overall math nerd. Um, so with that, we have Travis here today. Uh, he's been integral to the open source Python community, uh, as well as data science in general, working on his uh, projects like NumPy, Numba, um, SciPy, uh, Anaconda, things of that nature, uh, long list of accomplishments. So um, you know, thanks for coming out, Travis. Well, so it's great to be here. And it's really awesome to see all of you. I love meeting in person again. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't realize how much I missed it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's so much, in fact, so much has happened in Python because of the gathering. So much is done individually. You know, people go home and they, they write code, but a lot of why they write code or what they're writing for or the, the vision of what they're trying to accomplish came from meeting together. Like we've had, we've been having meetups. The SciPy meetup started. The SciPy conference started in 2001, 2000 timeframe, and a lot of people started to gather at Caltech and then in Austin, and just talk about what do we want to think? How, how should that analysis work? And it was that you know community of people that started. It's about 100, maybe 60 to 100, grew. I think there were 700 that came to SciPy last year, and the number of uh, of capabilities that have grown out of that those conversations is, is enormous. So that's kind of why I am passionate about open source, but it's not because I had an inclination this way when I started my career. It's just because I met, I saw the effect. And I was like, this is something I want to be a part of. Awesome. Well, before we get started, um, we have a couple of announcements. And so uh, I guess this is uh, being screen shared here. So um, you'll be able to go back and see, you know, not only this uh, Pi Data meetup, but also all of our previous ones on the YouTube channel. Um, I believe that link will be provided uh, on the event page. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, we have some open roles here at MetroStar, uh, ranging from principal AI engineer all the way out to uh, you know uh, data scientists, uh, both um, I believe mid-level and senior, um, and then also some uh, data engineering positions. As uh, we're, you know, uh, so as we're continuing to scale and grow, we're uh, we're always looking for people. So if you're interested, feel free to take a look. Uh, do we have another slide here as well? 
and then uh, we have the title slide here. So uh, with that, I guess we will get started. Um, so Travis, as we, I can hear myself and it's throwing me off. It's <laughs> That's a just weird. a personal thing. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> Who is uh, that? my voice is deeper than I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, as we talked about, you know, your work has been foundational to the open source data science community. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like to not only watch the work that you found to grow, but watch the community grow around it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's been life-changing, obviously. I mean, just really moving and really inspiring, I would say. Like, um, it's almost like watching a movie unfold in a way they're like, whoa, I did not expect this. But there were key things that happened. I mean, I, I was, uh, as a graduate student, I was studying machine, uh, I was studying MRI and ultrasound, mm -hmm. and I had already learned to process data from satellites using Perl and MATLAB. Um, and they were fine, but it was, I already kind of, the thrill of kind of scientific discovery through coding I'd had. When I went to the Mayo Clinic to study medicine or, or medical imaging, um, I, I was looking for another language because I, I didn't like Perl. I, I couldn't read it. When I, I wrote code, then a year later, I couldn't read what I'd written. I didn't know what I'd said. It was like, it was like write once, read never kind of. Yeah. Cool language, lots of stuff, but I found it hard. For, as an occasional person who was not, I was not dedicated a lot to software. I was thinking about MRI, I was thinking about uh, image processing, but I needed a language. So I, I found Python, and Python at the time is the first, is 90s, late 90s, 97, 98, 99 when I started using Python. And the open source community was also kind of, it's when Linux came out and people were hosting their own Linux boxes. While I was there at the Mayo Clinic, I put together a Linux cluster. I put Yellow Dog Linux on Mac OS's and hooked them together into a cluster, and I put an MRI simulator on it, and, and like I learned a ton doing that, and I loved the fact that I could like there were these communities out there that were, could, they were just sharing code and that code I could use, and I wasn't sort of trapped. I had previously when I was using MATLAB, I was I, I hit a brick wall, like I wanted to write a C extension to MATLAB, and I was having a problem with a license server and I couldn't run it because it wouldn't talk to this server, and I was like. That had happened to me before, and it was just so frustrating because I couldn't make progress. <laughs> Not because, you know, my, my own weakness or my own or technology problems, because of this weird licensing thing. <laughs> so those experiences made, made I, this was so much more exciting. I could keep going, I could keep building. Then I started to do things like, oh, I can write documentation, and I wrote the docs for Numeric. Numeric was an array library that existed in Python when I showed up. It was written in 94 by a guy, a, a graduate student at MIT named uh, Jim... Jim, oh my goodness, I have not my slide. Jim Huguenin. Yeah. Jim Huguenin <laughs> wrote, wrote this. It was a really cool tool. It actually was an array, a tensor, that could do broadcasting. It could do, it had floats instead of just doubles. Really powerful tool, actually. Um, and I started to use it, and I said, we're missing a lot of stuff. That's, I, I got addicted to helping the community and then seeing the response. So the first thing I, you know, 98, 99, you can go back and you can look at the mailing list. These are all public, actually. You can go look at the mailing list. All the conversation was public. People talking about, oh, we really need to have libraries like optimization. We need, if we just had that in Python, then we could just rule the world. It'd be great. I went, yeah, you're right. I was this young, inexperienced you know, student. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. I should do that. And you know, not telling my wife, and who I have three kids at home, and she's thinking I'm getting my PhD and trying to go make money. <laughs> and, but no, I'm actually writing software. <laughs> so for a year, I went, man, what was I doing that year? My thesis wasn't probably making much progress because yeah. I was, for a year, I was basically writing code. I wrote, you know, mm -hmm. libraries that effectively pulled Fortran, made it accessible to Python user. And Python's extensibility made that possible. Yep. And the sharing made it possible. And I got, and, and I was doing it quickly. Like, I wouldn't take very long. I'd take a few weeks, put something out there, and I got response. Yep. Like, not overwhelming response. I, wasn't, no, that's not, I mean, I know nowadays you have millions of TikTok followers, whatever. It wasn't like that. <laughs> like, I had like two or three, right? <laughs> but man, that was awesome, because I'd go to conferences and publish my papers, and nobody, and nobody, nobody would respond. <laughs> but I was actually getting people responding to this code I was writing. And so that was addicting. And it was, it was like, I, if you look, if I look at retrospect, I say, yeah, you were trained. <laughs> <laughs> the, the society trained you to do this. Mm -hmm. But I also, it really resonated with my desire to kind of see, I wanted people to be able to share the mm -hmm. code they had and, when they, and to learn and to enable. So that's where SciPy came from. It was actually those early years, 1999, creating a bunch of libraries. And that's, and when I started to do that, it, you know, other people were starting to do similar things. There were similar things happening. Mm -hmm. There was uh, 
um, John Hunter, um, who uh, wrote Maplotlib, hmm. right? It was a plotting library. Uh, pretty nice plotting library, actually, inspired by MATLAB. It's called Matplotlib. And he wrote, and again, he was doing kind of in his spare time, not doing the thing he was paid to do, but kind of related to what he was paid to do. As a graduate student, he basically wrote this plotting tool. And it was nice, and people started to use it because it was helpful. Um, and then friend, uh, Fernando Perez. And Fernando Perez was a graduate student, again, delaying his PhD to write IPython, which then became Jupyter. And that, that, you, you, you watch that happen. Mm -hmm. All this was early, early on, like pre, when Python 2 was still there. And it's all working on Python 2, and Python 1 in some cases. Uh, and, and you watch this happen with a small group of people. There weren't that many users. Like you look at Python's popularity, it was, it was not zero, but it wasn't big. In fact, I had a lot of people, you know, um, they'd go, well, why, you know, why are you using Python here? And when I first started to go into industry, so I was in academia doing all this. I was a student, and then I, I was a professor for a while as an intellectual and computer engineering, and there is where I wrote NumPy. And the reason was because I love SciPy. And SciPy was this collection of libraries that had now become a library called SciPy, and it was really a distribution of Python masquerading as a library, because it, it really had like 10 or 12 different packages all in one. But because shipping software was so hard, like how do I get this into people's desktops? Like the easiest way was to all make it one library and ship an executable. There weren't distributions of Python out there. So if there had, then we would have had separate libraries. Each of these would have been separate. And that would have been, that would have been better from a maintenance point of view, because mm -hmm. it was hard to maintain a big library with, because you really need individuals to own their pieces. Yeah. And those individuals owning their pieces, then how do you collect them? It, it really didn't work with the topology of the, the way open source collaboration occurs, and, and the community-driven governance occurs. So that actually became clear when the scikits showed up. So anyway, I've got lots of stories I could tell of the early days of how, and they're all, they're all interesting because their people are interesting. You know, John Hunter, we lost him actually to cancer uh, 10 years, 12 years ago now, right? The year we made, he was uh, on the first NumFocus board and then suddenly had this tragic for his family event. And uh, for us too, it was like we lost a great one. Uh, but there's been great, you know, the work that, that Fernando has done. And then in 2011, Wes McKinney showed up and made pandas, then the scikit-learn people, which was several people. There were actually a few people involved in scikit-learn's emergence. And those libraries were critical. Like pandas, you know, five years ago, when I would look at Anaconda's adoption and start seeing people using Anaconda, what were they installing? They were installing pandas, scikit-learn, and, and, and IPython, or Jupyter, mm -hmm. right? So I'm like, those, I could, I could see what were the libraries that people cared about, what were they using? Um, so it's been a phenomenal experience to sort of know all these people, kind of have them as personal friends, understand the conversations that led to the creation of their tools, watch how, you know, the doing it in the background, you know, there's no company funding this, there's just people with their passion, their individual interest driving it, and then the value that creates and also the challenges that creates, yeah. right? Of no, you know, no sustaining value. So that, it's been phenomenal, but it's led, it led me to my current career. Like that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing now is because of all that, you know, the hysteresis effect of that journey. <laughs> so yeah, I could go on and on about all of it. But <laughs> no, that's excellent. I mean, it's, I mean, it's integral to, because kind of what you were talking about earlier that got you into Python in the first place where, you know, running into those licensing issues and, you know, being able to have that extensibility was what allowed, you know, real all of this to happen, mm -hmm. which is awesome to see. Because, uh, you know, I take for granted, you know, someone who's been in this for only a few years, where, you know, from the start, I was able to, you know, pip install NumPy, you know, pandas, matplotlib, mm -hmm. all, you know, the traditional, you know, hello worlds of mm -hmm. data science. Um, you know, but all of that, you know, underpins all of these really absolutely cutting edge technologies that we're starting to see nowadays, where we start to get into, you know, things like, TensorFlow, PyTorch, when yes. we're getting into the deep learning side of the house, you know, all of this, you know, it's built on that same foundation. So um, it was a kind of to build off of the topic there, and I think you alluded to it a little bit, um, would love to hear a little bit more about um, kind of the, the topic that we're talking about today as far as, um, you know, how in your opinion um, is it that Python came to dominate the yeah. machine learning space? Yeah, it was really interesting because that was, I am, 
um, overwhelmed by how, much, how popular NumPy became. Like I knew it was meaningful what I was doing there, and I knew NumPy was meaningful. I didn't know how meaningful because of the shift of society. Mm -hmm. right? Because effectively we did this work in 2000 yeah. time frame. And by about 2000, then we had the big Python 2 to Python 3 fiasco that took from 2005 <laughs> to 2011, basically. <laughs> because Python 3 didn't really exist till Python 3.2. Mm -hmm. Actually, Python 3.4 is the first one I say was really Python 3. <laughs> Everything else was like alpha releases. But Python 3.4 was the first one you'd really actually want to use. Mm. And then 3.5, 3.6, now there's really quite a great work going. But there's a lot of time spent. Yeah. And all this had happened before kind of the attention gaze, yeah. right? Because one of the challenges is, and it's not perfect, like we were just talking earlier before the, podcast, before the, the, the show here, the, the meeting, I, there's things about NumPy that I, I said, you know, finally five years ago, I know what NumPy should have been. Yeah. Like, I didn't know until five years ago how I should have written NumPy. <laughs> and I wish somebody had been able to guide me. So there's, there's definitely some issues there that are, it's practical, it's useful, but it could be better. Yeah. And, um, but it was there and it was functional. Like, the big, probably the biggest thing about NumPy was that it's kind of a side effect of the fact I didn't have funding for it, is it was stable. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't, didn't do, I mean, it didn't change much. Right. <laughs> And so therefore, and you started to learn that actually that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. People need things that are, that are a place to just call home. They get, like, I know it's going to work, and I want to do something different, but I can make it work around. Mm -hmm. I can make it work my way. And so the extensibility of Python was huge, mm -hmm. underappreciated, actually, by a lot of people. Like, they think, why Python? Why did it, why did it succeed? Because you could extend it. Because, you know, occasional programmer could look in and actually make a new thing called NumPy mm -hmm. that extends the language, and it could get used. But that ability was critical. I think the readability was critical. I yeah. said Perl was hard to read when I tried it. <laughs> Python had the opposite experience. I, I did something a year later. <laughs> I did something in 97. A year later, 98, I came back and tried to look at it. I went, oh, I know what I just did. I, I can read this. Yeah. That was, for me, a, the, the point where I said, OK, I'm just going gonna, gonna to do Python. Yeah. It, it, it's readable. And so that's allowed a ton of people who aren't programmers. Like, I wonder who in the room would consider themselves a developer. Like, raise your hand if you consider yourself a developer. Hell yeah. Yeah, all right, yeah. <laughs> Glad you're doing that, Hussein. You <laughs> right? <laughs> Absolutely, but, but a lot of people come to Python, they're not really developers, but they're, they have important skills in some other area, the data science, machine learning. Mm -hmm. it, it, for me, it was, it was you know, science, scientific people, scientific programmers. Like, it's, in fact, it's a big blind spot. Like, mm -hmm. I have conversations with Microsoft in 2004. I've been talking to people at Microsoft since 2001, mm -hmm. 2002, because they became aware of this sort of, but they were constantly underappreciating this market. Mm -hmm. They kind of felt, oh, we're a developer. We have a developer market. Mm -hmm. And they, they think, okay, what's about 12 million developers in the world? And like, you're, there's, there's a massive number of people out there, which is ironic since Microsoft actually sells Excel, yeah. which is the biggest occasional programmer tool yeah. that, that it has, you know, has 200, 100 to 200 million users, yeah. right? But anyway, there's a whole gap of people. IBM and Microsoft were missing, not realizing this is a group of people. When you think about your language popularity, it's not just it's that occasional developer. Python mm -hmm. captured that group mm -hmm. in a way that was really useful. I, I heard a lot of times, I heard this over and over again when I was these early days with SciPy. Yeah, Python fits my brain. Yeah. Python gets out of my way. I'd heard yeah. that who'd say that. Like, I can think about my problem and not think about syntax. Mm -hmm. And that's due to Guido's genius of building a language for teaching. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he really paid attention to the syntax and making the language accessible. Mm -hmm. Now, is it, I'm not going to say it's perfect. I'm not going to say it's, you know, it couldn't have been better, but because I know, I know NumPy could be better. So I'm sure there's issues he probably thinks, sees as well. But those are all key things that came together. So when in 2015, TensorFlow, Google's making TensorFlow, which came from a library called Disbelief. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, uh, in, internally, they were using it. was a C++ library, and they said, well, we ought to do machine learning with this. Let's release this. Mm -hmm. They released their library. The whole community was like, well, where's the Python bindings? Yeah. Like, that's what happened. They basically just released this library and said, okay, let's get people to use it. And everyone's like, I'm not using that. Where's the Python bindings? Because they were already using Kind of Theano had put machine learning algorithms together early on in, in 2012. Mm -hmm. Like there was so much rich ecosystem already there mm -hmm. that had been built up over a decade. And when they came and said, okay, we'll do it, all, everyone was like, where's the Python bindings? <laughs> and so they had to make them. And then uh, Meta followed suit. They had a different set of libraries <laughs> that now are PyTorch and they needed Python, bind Python bindings. They even called it PyTorch initially, even though it was kind of Lua based and C++ based initially. Mm. 
but they had, you know, I talked to Sumith, who was the creator <laughs> of PyTorch, and, you know, he was sort of clear about that, that, well, you know, the, the community wanted Python bindings. <laughs> and so they kind of, they need, they had to write them. And then once they did, of course, the machine learning took off, like right. a deep learning in particular. Yeah. And all those users suddenly were going, and not just those users, but all the hype around those users, like all the, this is the future, machine learning is the future. Because for the previous seven years, there'd been a lot of hype around Spark and Hadoop, and don't get me started on that. That's a, <laughs> that's a longer conversation, and I, I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> but there was a lot of kind of misdirected thinking mm -hmm. about big data that was really kind of the, the revenge of the, of the you know, middle-aged Java aficionados, right? <laughs> Who, and Java has a, fi has a fine language. It's got great things about it. But for data processing, it never had a strength. In the 90s, Fortran beat Java, and everyone knew that. And it was, it was never going to be the case that Java came back to win that best story. Mm -hmm. But still, it kept being forced through on the analysis side. Yeah. That was the problem, mm -hmm. right? But they were forced to use Python, and then you see in the data, mm -hmm. once that happened and TensorFlow started really promoting a lot of money all of a sudden, millions of dollars started getting spent on TensorFlow, yeah. millions of dollars spent at every organization, all of a sudden, Python's rise. So that's what I attribute it to, is like all the work of this community to create a substrate that when the large investments started to come in, mm -hmm. they use Python. Yeah. And now it's kind of interesting to see what happens next. Because right? <laughs> we have this mix of community-driven ethos, mm -hmm. which is still very strong. We also have a lot of corporate money now, like a lot of right. you know, billions of dollars being spent, yeah. and they're kind of mixing in this frothy you know, tidewater. We'll see where that actually goes. It'll yeah. be interesting to see. No, absolutely. And um, yeah, and that's uh, leads into the really the next uh, topic piece where, you know, as we're you know we're all trying to learn here and trying to think about what's going to come next, right? In the uh, mm. the Python data science community. So as we're you know all looking to learn new things and as you know. Uh, Python continues to grow. Um, you know, it's it's an excellent tool. We're all working with it. Um, what do we see? And I know there's there's no crystal ball here, right? We we talked about that. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I should tell you I didn't do well in the market last year, so don't. Yeah. Yeah, my prognostications <laughs> might not be that great. <laughs> <laughs> Starting a club, uh, but the uh, with the with um, as we're all trying to you know plan on what we're learning. Um, you know, we see. Python very strong today, you know, do we see that moving into the future? I know there are challengers like Julia, you know, some people prefer R, things of that nature. You know, uh, what are your thoughts on ah, Python continuing to dominate? The continuing domination of Python. Yeah, yeah um, good question. Uh, we're going to live in a polyglot world for forever, yeah. right? So I think Python will remain a strong part of our ethos for a long time. Yeah. Essentially, in, in what you have to look at is is when do people stop being taught Python, mm -hmm. right? Because when they stop being taught Python, then you have, then 40 years later, the language will stop, will, will stop being used, <laughs> but really like 40 to 60 years later. Because yeah. ultimately, the, especially something like Python, where people who are going to learn one language, and they're not going to learn tons of languages, mm -hmm. it's their careers yeah. and their, their career trajectory, and they'll still use it. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to think about that, because you know, Fortran is still out there. Mm -hmm. Like I know, I don't know if anybody here uses Fortran, a lot of people kind of snicker when they think Fortran. The Fortran is a fantastic language, actually. And it was very useful for a purpose. Not, mm -hmm. not for writing GUIs, not for writing web servers, not for writing some things, but for writing analysis code. Mm -hmm. Really good. And still used by people who are wanting to do high, uh, analysis code. I have a friend, Andre Surtek. He's sure Fortran's going to make a comeback. So, <laughs> yeah, good, you could, he's got a compiler for Fortran. It's based on LVM. It's, it's all cool. And it's, 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 it's cute. I like it. Mm. <laughs> But I'm not, I'm not going to say Fortran is going to come back. <laughs> uh, I do think we'll live in a polyglot world. I think mm -hmm. interfaces I think that, are, that allow for that, that mm -hmm. recognize that we're not in the one language world anymore. Uh, I think there's things like that that are emerging where it's about APIs, it's mm -hmm. about interfaces. Um, that, I think there's things like WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. you know, I was a big fan of LLVM. I still am. Low-level virtual machine, badly titled, but it's the compiler tool set. It's really cool, actually. That's where Numba was based on. And then Jax and PyTorch, they're all compiling Python now. Like, everybody's compiling Python now to native code. And LLVM becomes a, a substrate for that. <laughs> WebAssembly is kind of similar for the web. It's like a, ver it's a VM story. And, and PyScript was released by, by Anaconda. <laughs> uh, Peter Wang gave a great talk on it at the latest PyCon. 
really cool tool. All of a sudden, you can embed Python in your in your web pages, <laughs> and you know JavaScript's not the only language anymore on the web. Python can work just fine. That's really cool. And WebAssembly starts to be. I think those technologies are really powerful. <laughs> I don't see. I think Julia will continue to start being to still be used. They didn't follow my advice. <laughs> I told the Julia creators <laughs> ten years ago, right? <laughs> And when I had a chance to talk with them with the DARPA X data program, I said, look, you make Julia the easiest way to write a Python extension and it will get adopted. You'll get users. Um, they didn't do that, unfortunately, because it could, that, that's still, that would have been useful. So today, Python extensions are still kind of a question mark. Like num people are writing number code, number code, you don't need to write an extension anymore because it just compiles on the fly. If you're writing Jax code, PyTorch 2.0 is compiling Python to native code. Um, Cython exists. Cython is still the way Pandas and Scikit-Learn, they're all using Cython, which is an extension language. If you're a young person or interested in building something, I'm really excited by something I'm calling static Python. Other people are too. It's kind of this idea of a Cython 2.0. Like if you actually wrote Cython 2.0 to be a language that was compilable to native code, but it was a subset of Python, that's a powerful tool. Like, and there's a lot of things you could do there that would actually iteratively move the industry forward. Because one of the challenges of any kind of, any kind of upstart, right, <laughs> is shared abstractions are a big deal, right? You and I talking, sharing a language, like, it's hard to communicate unless you have that abstraction we both accept. How do you get people to accept something together? Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of money <laughs> or, and or time. There's sort of like a money time curve that you have to, that's why people spend a ton of money on marketing. You can spend billions of dollars and get people to accept an idea and then say this, this idea matters. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that to make Python succeed. We did it by kind of winning hearts and minds mm -hmm. one at a time over 15 years, yeah. right? <laughs> Not recommending that the only way, but that's basically what we did. <laughs> the grassroots. The grassroots yeah. approach, right? It takes a long time, but it's also pretty robust, mm -hmm. right? Because you keep winning. I think there's, I think there's incremental ways to go from here to there. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I'm not, you know, I like, I like the, my Julia friends, I like my our friends. I don't think they're going to take, o take over. I, don't, I think the network effects of Python are too big at this point. Yeah. I think they're going to be still used. Um, I would love to see a static Python. So if anyone's out there interested in that, <laughs> and, you know, uh, uh, Anaconda has some ideas around that too, but there's a real opportunity there. It's risky. I mean, it's, yeah. there, there's other people who, who think there's other approaches, but... Mm. So that's where I would look for <laughs> innovation is actually on the periphery of what you can do that works today that takes us a little farther down the track. And there's a lot of PyScript, static Python, WebAssembly. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of places where I think it's worth looking. Awesome. So as we're you know, kind of taking that forward look and everything um, more on the data science side, so you know, if we're looking to learn new techniques that maybe are you know, a fledgling technique nowadays that uh, you know, maybe in like, three to five years will be taking flight, you know, um, what are some thoughts you have around things that are interesting nowadays that with some continued development could, uh, could really take off? Well, here? a lot of things I just named are exactly yeah. that. Right, yeah. <laughs> They're going to all need to continue in development to really take off. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of answered part of that, but I would say around the, particularly the data part, mm -hmm. you know, there's still, um, it's still hard to uh, compute with GPUs. Right. Right. There's still a lot of pain points between doing that. I think the, you really want people to be able to write code one place and have it run everywhere. Yeah. Like the desktop to data center problem, you want people not to have to keep changing how they're writing code. Yeah. Um, there's still the question of where's my data and how am I storing it? Yeah. You know, we've got lots of upstart ideas there that are happening and some you know, long-term goals that are going well. Um, I think that deep learning <laughs> and machine learning generally is still going to have you know wild effects that I'm looking at kind of the ability now you can actually go to Copilot you can go to ChatGPT is showing it but Copilot's offered by GitHub and you can basically just get code written generated yeah like all of a sudden you just say this is what I want to do and then here you are here's the code to do that whoa that's that's impressive right yeah. um, how, what where is that going to take us you know so all of a sudden coding is more about you know the weights of a model I'm waiting. I mean, if you think about what a deep learning model is, mm -hmm. like it's not code in there. No. If you were to take apart a deep learning model, it's not like you're going to see if statements and it's an array. You're going to see an array of numbers, <laughs> yeah. right? It's like you know uh, Frederick Hayek, who was a I don't know if you know Frederick Hayek. He's a he's a, one of my heroes. Uh, he was a student of the brain in the early 19 
part of this by the 19th century, 20th century, early 1900s. And he, you know, you open up the brain, you can't make sense of the brain by looking at it, <laughs> right? Oh, see all these stuff here. Mm -hmm. We still don't understand how consciousness works, right? But that's going to be similar. We're going to start seeing these artificial model, intelligence models mm -hmm. that do amazing things. All of a sudden, how's that going to work? Like, how are we going to understand them in, I think, components and being able to understand how to build something like that, even if we're not all going to be doing ch trainings at the level of ChatGPT, understanding how to train a basic machine learning model, a basic deep learning model in particular, but also machine learning model to start. I think that's, that's going to become table stakes. Like developers will need, like just like web programming, right? You have to learn to put an HTML or a website up. You got to learn how to build a basic model. Yeah, awesome. That's um, good, good to know because I spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, job security for you, right? Yeah, <laughs> it feels good, you know. But, uh, yeah, it's sort of self-fulfilling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, yeah. I may have targeted that question. No, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, with us being in you know, the, the D.C. area, a lot of us work in some way, shape, or form with the government. And you know, the government, of course, uh, playing a role in you know, uh, the, the programming space as well. Um, so I was curious about you know, what your thoughts are on how the government can continue to play a role in the open source space as well as how the open source space can continue to help you know, our country as a whole. Yeah, I think that's a really great question. It, it dovetails, like my passion is to help connect communities and organizations, mm -hmm. communities and companies, but I think there's a lot of opportunity to connect open source communities with government as well in mm -hmm. ways that are more robust and, and, and useful. Mm -hmm. Like fundamentally, if the government's funding something, why isn't it open source? Right. Like that's that's just, I mean, we and I understand a little bit why, because part of that's like, well, we have to have markets and sort of have sustainability, so we're gonna allow you to proprietize it. And and I, I don't, I, I think there's a there's a little bit of that that's probably still necessary. Mm -hmm. But, well, but we can also, like if you're, if you're funding public work, then why don't you make it open source and then it can be a foundation to build other things on top of. Mm -hmm. Like just so great, then it can't, then make it BSD licensed or MIT licensed or Apache licensed. Yeah. Right, so other people can build stuff on it. Like I could see a lot of like more awareness in government mm -hmm. that that's how you actually should fund software. Right. Instead of funding proprietary software, if you're gonna use public money to fund it, make it, make it infrastructure. Yeah. Make it open source, make libraries, make, and, and then invest in those communities. Mm -hmm. You see a little bit of that right now. I think there's, um, there's a couple of things that probably are needed mm -hmm. in terms of like, actual legislation needed yeah. to sort of help people out of the patterns of the past that are currently what's dominating most government funding mm -hmm. and sources. We have some really you know, heroes, people at NASA, like there, there's a grant that uh, uh, somebody there basically got funded to help support the open source libraries. Mm -hmm. Um, I've talked a lot at length with some of the folks involved in this creation of this substrate. Again, for 15 years we wrote this with like little money, like no government grants. We stole it from here, pulled it from there, pulled it from our future, you know, opportunity cost, whatever. We're building this stuff. And, you know, meanwhile, the government spent a lot of money on other stuff, right? <laughs> it, and I'm not, I don't know the answer because I'm not saying, I'm actually not a fan of, I don't want a ministry of open source. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want, you know, all open source must be produced by government. I, no, that's, that's mm -hmm. not what I'm looking for at all. I'm, yeah. I'm not a believer in that approach. Mm -hmm. I do think though that if government is spending money on things, they should be leaning towards open source, like open source by default. Yeah. And if you, you have to have a reason not to make it open source. Yeah. Instead of the flips, the currently you have to have a reason to make it open source. Right. And we should flip that. Yeah. And there's some good people doing work in that direction, but I think more is needed. Yeah, absolutely. So we have in our audience here in person as well as online, people from all sorts of backgrounds, whether they're just now getting interested in data science or they've been in the space for years and years. Um, so what would be some words of advice that you would have for the people that are here today or the people that are listening they're online? They're just getting involved? Or, uh, or have yeah, been in for a while? Uh, yeah, just getting involved would be a good start. Yeah, yeah. depends what you're, where you're at. Fair, advice fair enough. I'd give, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would say, you know, one is, is uh, figure out your interests. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if something's going to sustain you and you're going to keep doing it for a long period of time, mm -hmm. you ha it has to be part of you. It can't be something you're just doing for, for money or for some other mercenary reason, for fame or some other. If that's what's driving you, you're going to have a hard time, right? Because, you know... It takes a while. Uh, another word of advice is don't give up. Um, if you're working on something and you're finding yourself, you're not getting traction you think you ought to be getting. So one, 
in the past, it took at least 18 months, right? And that was in the past. That was with not as much, you know, other comp competing interests. I, I think, you know, 18 months is kind of a minimum. If you've got something that's out there and you're trying to see if it's getting adoption, mm -hmm. you know, keep looking at why, do some early day beta testing, look at, get reasons from people, but don't assume you're failing because it's taking a while to get adoption. There's, you know, Dask is a good example. Mm -hmm. At Anaconda, we started Dask, uh, and Matt Rockland, when I remember having a conversation with him where he was saying, man, Dask just isn't, isn't going anywhere. Maybe we, we should stop doing this or maybe, maybe we're not doing the right thing. I said, well, how long have we been doing this? Yeah. Like it's been eight months or nine months or, or you, no, it's just give it, it's going to take at least 18 months. And so two years, again, two years, we should look at it. Mm -hmm. And there's projects I've done that I've stopped doing, mm -hmm. but it took, you know, a year and a, a year or more to do before I'd make that choice. Um, you got to give it time. So follow your passion, give it time, uh, keep learning, you know, ask good questions, find mentors, don't be afraid to ask a dumb question. There isn't a dumb question. There are dumb questions, I'm sorry. Yes, there are. But, I was say, I could challenge that. Yeah, there, there are dumb questions, there are. I mean, um, but people are pretty nice, right? So, you know, if they're not, then maybe you don't want to talk to them anyway. So think of the dumb questions you ask, they were just tests of your, someone you were going to talk to and like, okay, you failed that test because you gave me a, you were rude to me back. So sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was a dumb question, but it, but it's okay because you're just trying to find mentors. Yeah. Right. And, and who's going to resonate with you. So, so ask, that's mm -hmm. what I wish I'd have done more. Mm -hmm. I'm shy by nature actually. Yeah. And so I felt like I didn't ask enough questions mm -hmm. and try to get some help. Yeah. Uh, I look at things like if I could have had more advice and mm -hmm. so seek it, go find it, go yeah. ask. Well, people are be more responsive than you think. Yeah, well, on that note, uh, we should probably open it up for questions, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great. Do we have uh, the mic, I think? Awesome. Do we have any questions here in person to start off? Yeah. Hey, um, is this, can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so you alluded towards it a little bit before with like chat GPT and stuff, right? And so how long in your like experience or like with your you know wisdom of the field how long do you think it is before chat gpt or other tools like that are building out major components that can be used in you know live systems and then with that in mind what do you think is the first area to like get like like automated out like what do you see as like the lowest hanging fruit of automated code creation mm -hmm. that's just gonna Great Bye -bye. question. Great question. So I don't. I think we're actually pretty close on ChatGPT type systems. You already see with Google your Copilot from GitHub. I, I think we're two years, right? Even like eighteen months. I mean, I think some of these things you'll start to see soon, right? I think it's possible to build them now. I've, I've watched people who are like pull stuff together and do it now. So, like, if you're on the cutting edge, you can do it like in three months, right? But Something produced in three months is going to need some time to mature before people will actually use it in practice. But like a couple of years, honestly, one thing that I think the, the lowest hanging fruit is Stack Overflow. <laughs> actually, like if you look at how people have used, like effectively, like my, my daughter is a, a medical student, but also a bioinformatic master's program, and she writes code and and you know she writes um, and she uses Stack Overflow a lot because basically getting started and what do I do? You ask questions. And when I was younger, it was Google I would use. Stack Overflow became the way she uses. I, like, I sat there and, and she, when using ChatGPT, she's like, oh yeah, I would just use this. <laughs> and she said that, you know, last week, so. So effectively, I, I only have, have two years left of a job. Are you at Stack Overflow? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I oh. mean, let's be real, like that's where all of my answers come from. Yeah. <laughs> Well no, well, no, I mean, what's your job, actually? Oh, I'm a software engineer, but a data engineer by trade. Yeah, yeah, no, actually, I, th I, I don't think that's at risk. I think Stack Overflow itself, right, as an organization. You severely underestimate how much I use Stack Overflow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, you'll use this other system instead. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't, actually, I know you do, <laughs> because I know what I use. Like, cut, I call it cut and paste programming. Uh -huh. It's real. Yeah, it's like, of course you do that. Like, why wouldn't you? If you're not doing that, what are you doing? You're sitting there typing code from scratch, hoping you for Exclusively remember. Exclusively documentation. Right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, it's, it's exactly right. But I, that was one application. I get excited about, oh, actually, this could be applied. There's a lot of, 
let's call it untractable code bases out there. Like you look at a lot of, I know people who work in the government know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of legacy code out there, right? That is actually a mess. Like imagine <laughs> if you could actually take and take a large language model and apply it to that code and actually, now you can start to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> like could you actually create, you know, porting capabilities or you know, take this and actually move it over here? That's another, you know, low hanging fruit, I think. Um, I think it's, it's just kind of exciting to see the combination of large, not just large language models, but large image processing models, large you know, neural nets, what they can do. I don't think they're, they're going to make your job more fun and you're still going to be needed because um, it'll be a while before we're comfortable letting a machine do all that work without at least someone to say, yep, I, I, I stand up for it. I'm the person that says, yeah, that's okay. How much, how long, I don't know. I mean, it depends on what, what you're doing, but you'll have to level, I mean, if your job is just making API calls between SOAP and XML, yeah, yeah, you know, start learning more. <laughs> don't just keep doing that. But, uh, but if your job is to actually make computers work for humans and do good things for them, there'll still be a lot of need for that. No, great, great question. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Simon with Global, Global AI Fund. Travis, I, I look at your, your bio as the founder of Anaconda, NumFocus, and PyData, creator of NumPy, SciPy, and Number. And I'm, I'm curious, what is the difference, that, what has been the difference for you between the two, between being a founder and a creator? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it's very different, yeah. In some sense, there is a difference, in some sense there's not. Because um, when, I, when I talk about, so there's a period of time when I was writing NumPy, that was very lonely, right? There's a period of time when you're building a company that's also very lonely, where you're basically doing something and trying to make, trying to justify your future existence. Right? You're, you're thinking, what is this thing? I got to make it so other people will care about it. But then, how you decide whether that's something people are going to care about, you have to go engage with other people, right? NumPy is what it is, not because I went off for many, many years and wrote something, because I was a participant in the community, first of all, and I saw a need, and frankly, I wrote NumPy because I thought, well, nobody else will do it, and I think it needs to be done. In some sense, Anaconda exists for the same reason, because um, I, I was an older founder. In fact, I, was, I had the mistaken notion that you couldn't be a founder if you were you know, older than 25, right? Because <laughs> My understanding of a founder was someone that could live on ramen noodles and would just like <laughs> just have no money and then kind of build something awesome. It's sort of this 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 hypothetical notion. It's not true. So you have to I have you have to go engage with people. And um, but the, it's it's a little bit like the maker manager difference, you know. Um, but NumPy had a manager portion too. Like the NumPy was write some code, then go get the first tranche of ten people that will help you actually keep building that code get them engaged, see where they can help, uh, respond to their pull requests, engage with them when they have an idea that's different than what you might think. Like the hardest part, of, I think, of a community building around code is actually when someone disagrees with you, right? And, and they don't do it the same way you would do it, right? It turns out to be very similar to building a company. When you need that somebody to come into your company and they don't think like you do exactly. And that's actually a good thing because you want the company to be bigger than your mind. Like if, if the company you build is only as big as your mind, it's not as big as it could be. It's not as good as the, it's not as robust as it could be with a bigger group. So that, that's some of the similarities but differences. Um, money was a bigger, is the other one. Like with NumPy, I didn't have to really worry about trying to raise money and with being a founder of a company, I've had to worry about money. <laughs> so I have to get people to write a check. Right? And, and I wasn't that good at doing that with NumPy. <laughs> getting people to write a check, um, but I, you know, come fund this thing. Uh, I didn't try that hard, but um, with, with, with uh, company building, you have, to, you have to get some money <laughs> to start with. Yeah. Here at Metrostar, thank you for talking about some uh, future trends that you see in technology, and thank you for giving some of your advice to developers and data scientists. My question would be, what is something that bothers you within the open source community and how would you change it? Ooh, that's a little bit loaded. Are we on stream? Are <laughs> <laughs> you ready to be canceled? Um, <laughs> I, I, actually, that's something that bothers me is kind of the, the tendency to weaponize codes of conduct. I've been very bothered by that. Um, I like treating, I, I think it's important that we treat people well. I'm very, so I, I like the principle of using, of, of but people, 
there was bad actors and good actors before formalization of codes of conduct, right? There were, that happened all the time. And, and there does need to be some, like, that's what a community ultimately is, is the product of its self-policing. Like what a community is, is who they allow in and who they don't allow in. And that's kind of a function of the early, of the early um, participants, the early leaders. And the early leaders are people that show up first. Like a lot of Python success actually does come from Guido's personality, because they, how he treated the early adopters, how he listened. He didn't just say, oh, that's a dumb idea. I, don't, I didn't think of it, so it's dumb, right? He was willing to allow ideas that he didn't, like he didn't really understand NumPy numeric, but he allowed them to, you know, there was insistence they put complex numbers in the language, right? And so he said, okay, I don't really know why, but we'll do it. So one thing that bothers me at open source communities is sometimes those early leaders, it's less about formalization of the code of conduct and more about which can be weaponized, which I don't like, when people use it as like a bludgeon. Oh, I'm going to get you with this code of conduct. Well, why can't we just talk about the problems we're seeing? And, you know, and I've, there's, there's issues that show up there. But with early days, like er, when you are a participant in the community, engaging honestly with people and not trying to game it. Like, you know, sometimes you see a few people, and maybe they're, they're wanting to participate, so they come in and they'll make some, oh, cool, I made a small change to that code, now I'm a contributor. And, why are you doing that? Like, what, the, the, you're just wasting people's time? Like, I'm not talking about small changes that are meaningful. Small changes are fine. If you went in today and fixed that, 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 type, that typo in that doc string, awesome. That was helpful. But going in and seeing, I, I added two spaces between these words and added a comma and replaced a comma with a semicolon. Why? Well, just so I could get my name on the contributor list. That behavior is really, uh, you know, not great. It's also easy to detect. So it's like, I don't, you're not doing yourself any favors. Like, <laughs> Everybody can see that this is a useless contribution, so it's not helping you. Um, but I, so I don't know why that, that does still happen though sometimes. You see it with like the October hackathon that came out and people said, oh, we'll give you a t-shirt if you make some code contribution. So people made a bunch of stupid code contributions, got t-shirts. Like those, that, that kind of stuff can hurt. Um, I think, you know, just that's probably what mostly, I think the, the other thing that bothers me that's a little hard to talk about is the open source can be the tyranny of the available, <laughs> the tyranny of the unemployed, <laughs> the tyranny of people who have nothing else to do. <laughs> um, and, and that's a little hard to say because it's not to say people that don't have something else to do may have really great contributions to make, right? And I think actually the fact that, op that, that Python created all this incredible software was because the people that didn't have anything to do were students. It wasn't like they didn't have any value, it's just they were in a time of life where money didn't matter as much. And so they could just work on what they cared about, right? Because of the choice they'd made to be a student. I mean, it was a selective, bi selective bias. The people had already made that choice, which is a questionable choice in some degree. Like, like, why should you be a student and not make money and go get a PhD? You're not going to make more money than you should go get make money now. That's still a question. It's a really open question. And it's a good point. People had already done that, <laughs> decided to go get the PhD, now had some excess time and used their time to build software. Really cool. Right, but sometimes open source can be, oh, it's open source because some people just spent their spare time and they, were on it, they weren't gonna do anything useful anyway, and now that thing is sitting there as a kind of a block in the river. Because everyone goes, well, we're using this open source thing, well, why that one? It needs to be fixed. Well, because everyone uses it. Why does everyone use it? Because everyone uses it. It, it. it can create this, it's kind of a, I don't know what, what to call it exactly, but I'm not the only one that's talked about this. I've, uh, there's some French writers that have talked about it better than I, can, I have, just about this kind of sense of open source can sometimes stall progress because people think that, oh, this is the open source way, so we should just do this, instead of, no, nah, actually it's a bad approach. We, could, we should undo it, do something different. Yeah. So I don't know, hopefully that, hopefully that gets the people talking, and, <laughs> and, if, you, and, and, and if, you, if I said something to offend you, I, I don't mean to, and you can definitely, um, uh, happy to be corrected and to, and to learn something new. So we, oh, sorry. Uh, I was just gonna take one of the questions that we had online really quick. Go ahead, awesome. Go ahead. Yeah, I got you next in line. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we have a question here online um, from uh, David Drummond. He asked, um, he's seen some people really enthusiastic about making high quality prompts for large language models, probably chat GPT. Um, do you see this being an important skill for data professionals going oh. forward? Yeah, high quality prompts that we were just talking about earlier today. In fact, right now with the state of large language models, how you ask the question can give you a better result for sure. Kind of the same way Google Foo existed, there's gonna be like LLM Foo. 
like large language model through, like if you, if you frame your question well, you get better results. And so that does lead to, oh, somebody could actually frame, like provide an interface to a certain user set that they just put templates in and they frame the question well. Yeah. I already saw in the podcast I did or the, the webinar I gave with Peter and another and Alex, mm -hmm. Alex had already written something like that. <laughs> where he basically built a template to ask a large language model and get pretty good answers back. Nice. So it's, yeah, there's, I think that's a really insightful question. Yeah. And I think there'll be a lot of, uh, I don't know how long that'll last. Yeah. That's the only question, because it's a bit of an arms race, right? right? You keep writing better questions, that just trains the model to be responsive to different questions. And so I, I, I don't know how to predict that. What's that iteration going to be like? Is that going to be, yeah, that works for three months, and then it's not needed anymore, because the large language model understands everything. Like <laughs> a better way to, you know, your, your questions don't have to be as hard. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, the, the training, it's still a lot of data. Like these, vol these, these models are gi ginormous. Yeah. Like they're billions of parameters. GPT-4, I've heard it's trillions of parameters trying to make it. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like, even, even with our, you know, terabyte disk space, okay, you're gonna have a whole terabyte of disk space for, for the parameters of the model? <laughs> and now, what's it gonna run on? Like, the inference can still be done, but like, that's a lot of data. Yeah. So, really, you can't be loading that from, like, you have to have a big machine yeah. to run that model. So, you know, I, 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 that, that'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested in accessibility, like having ChatGPT, cool, let's have the stability diffusion to DALL-E equivalent. Mm -hmm. What's the, you know, <laughs> DALL-E versus stability diffusion, let's go, you know, ChatGPT to, is it, you know, there's some out there that could potentially be, be, be potential for that. I'm looking for that event. Is that gonna be three months from now, six months from now, a year from now? It'll happen, yeah. hopefully sooner than later. Awesome, so you're up young, yeah. <laughs> Travis, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think, I think the benefits of open source, self-explanatory, no licensing, check. Um, bleeding edge, check. But you know, as a, you know, Mr. we're a technology integrator, so we try to be agnostic, although I think we have a pretty big push, thanks to folks like Wilson, around open source. Hey, this is the way to go. But when we look at a lot of our clients, like especially governments, but also some industries that have never been historically tech heavy, mm -hmm. there's a lot of resistance. Mm -hmm. And if you think about, I guess, our role in trying to push the adoption mm -hmm. of open source, you know, the biggest thing that we always get was well, security, you know, security, security, security. And it's always easier to go with a cost solution that, well, no one's gonna fire me if I go with X, Y, Z, you know? And I'm curious, what do you see as some of the big factors that's gonna drive an increasing adoption of open source where, it may not be applicable to every situation, but certainly becomes yeah. a more default versus it becomes, well, I can't find a COD, so I'm just gonna go with open source, where it's almost like secondary. Yeah, this is where I see a lot of opportunity, actually, for uh, innovation opportunity, basically. I think there's a ton of companies that could exist that effectively bring open source to that user. Because you're absolutely right, there's people out there that just want solutions. Like, I don't really care about your open source or your open schnorse. I just need this thing to work, right? I need it to, I need someone to, I need, I need a throat to choke if it doesn't work, right? And if you just tell me, oh, go to GitHub, there's the people, like, huh? Like, they don't, that won't, that won't fly, right? So, you know, we've, uh, at Open Teams, we have actually a, the, I think it's the first, but it's like general open source support product. The way we do it is by leveraging the uh, community of people that actually provide that support. Tidelift does a similar thing for, for uh, not just how do I support problems, but for security bugs, so Tidelift exists. But I think individual companies could exist that solve a user story and say, no, we're giving you the solution. The fact that we're using open source, sure, but if you have a problem customer, it's my problem. And I'm providing you a solution and, I'm, and you're paying for it. Like that can exist and, and could exist. There could be thousands of those in every domain, right? So I think it presents a really opportunity actually, which I like because I like a world where we're not dominated by single entities. Like, that's generally my worldview philosophy is I like people and I like organization, I like cooperation. But when we have like single entities emerge that are dominating everything, like we need lots of competing entities just to keep ourselves honest, right? And so I think we have a chance to push back against kind of the previous version of cooperation that have led to these massive organizations controlling things. Like how do we actually have lots of competing, and open source can facilitate that too. So a lot of people providing that extra level to serve your customer. So I'd say the opportunity is there for the taking, for a lot of people to do that. Provide this, you know, supported, 
business solution, supported mission solution, right? That you're using open source effectively. And what I'm trying to do with, with that is like, as you're doing that, make sure you're caring for your open source community. Make sure that what you're doing isn't just, oh, thank you very much, open source community, and have the false notion you can just pretend that you'll keep supporting it. And the people who actually made it are like, oh, see ya, good luck. Okay, you can try that. And then what happens, like, how are you gonna make it work? It's like, you're gonna have to essentially recreate the community. Why don't you just use it and just nurture it? Like a little bit of, a little bit of uh, watering, a little bit of support can go a long way to creating an, amount, an amazing e ecosystem of providers to, to our technology needs. So that, that's the big vision I see in open source. It's, it's really, we need that last mile though. It's not about open source or big tech product. product. It's actually open source as the foundation for lots of product, products that are supporting all the business use cases. That, that makes sense? Uh, yeah. So we've got time for one more question. Oh. <laughs> Maybe two quick ones? Sure. Uh, sure. Thanks. Um, I'm a I'm data scientist. Um, I run into a lot of people who are interested in no code, low code type solutions, especially within data science, the data robot. I know what AWS is trying to do, all this type of stuff where you can, you know, somebody who might not be trained in this stuff, maybe not even coding can do it. What do you think about those types of tools? That's a great question. So generally, low code is really hard to do well. Like, I, I think there's an opportunity there, but you have to do it well. And what, what, what not well is, is, hey, here's this low code solution, and you can do a demo, and then something real comes up, and you basically, oh, my low code thing gets me this way, but I can't get all the way there, and then I fall off a massive cliff. And it's massive. It's like it's even deeper than if you just started down here. <laughs> you, know, you look at Python, Python's kind of a low code tool already, you know, because it's like it's already wrapping libraries that are more complicated. So if already, there's already that level of abstraction. I can see a space for lower, like higher levels of abstraction, but you have to do it in a way that you can get back, go back and forth. I think that's what's typically missing is that how easy is it to go from your low code solution to your, I can see there is what it's doing at a different level. Um, again, that's just a hypothesis, but I, I think there is a place for low code. And I'd, I think that's an opportunity actually horizon right now. There's a few people out there doing some interesting work there, uh, but you have to do it well. And doing it badly has been done a lot. <laughs> so I don't know if that helps, but there is a uh, debugability, I guess, is one of the things, and then complexity. These are the two, like, can I debug it? And then, and then if I'm, as my low code, recognize that like a loop, like if, you, know, you see these old drawing things where you end up with this crazy picture with a lot of loops, like just say four, like just, <laughs> You don't have to, like, don't do this in a weird way. Like, code, like a, a function, maybe the best low code solution. Let someone write a function. Anyway, so I think you just have to be careful and, and, and not assume that nobody can type text. Like, don't, don't make that assumption. People can type text. It's, 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 it's where and when and how. Uh, Mike, I'd like to, uh, my question probably relates to a lot of the things we already talked about. And I want to ask, um, have you figured out how to solve the open source sustainability problem? Because there's... I think so, actually. The alignment, <laughs> like, what, what I'm seeing a, a lot of times is just the alignment is just not there. So if you're a private business, you use open source and you just use it and you don't contribute back because it's not in your quote unquote interest. Yeah. Uh, if you're an employee, you have to, you know, you have to have a job, and but you're not you're paid for the results, but you're not really paid to yep. work on the tooling. Yep. This. So, so this is actually yeah. what drives me. This is why I'm doing. It's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like a lot of people ask me, like, well, I would go get a job, do something else. I'm like, well, could I go do that and then still solve this problem? Maybe. Um, I love that question. It's driven me for. 25 years, basically, because the reason I'm an entrepreneur is because I asked that same question as a young person writing sci-fi with three kids and a wife that expected me to work. She was, you know, she's taking care of the kids and, and done a tremendous job with our family. But the trade we made was I'm going to go support the family. So well, how am I going to do that if I'm just giving away my code? So I've been thinking about this a long time, and, it's, and, I, and it led me to think about entrepreneurship and about markets. And so, you know, done a lot of it working with hedge funds, investment banking, by creating organizations. There are, 
a lot of ways. Here's one, right, we're working on. So first of all, consulting is one you can do, and it, it works fine. That's what we're doing right now. It's not, the, it's not the end all. But we came up with a plan. I'm really excited about it, though. I just need about $5 million to do it. So if anybody has $5 million they want to put to work for something that would absolutely change the world, like trillions of dollars of outcome, let's talk, because I, I believe we know what to do. It's, it's this concept we call Faro SS, and what you do is you get companies to give part of their equity or revenue to open source itself through an organization, the custodian. And we've constructed those instruments, constructed the SPV, and essentially that custodian holds on to some of the equity of the company. And, so, and then as that company grows in value, the project grows in value. So the key is the open source. You, we have basically an open source tree of dependencies that flows, flows to a tree of dependencies. So now all of a sudden NumPy, Pandas, Python, LibC, all the libraries, there's a fraction of every company's value that's sitting right here in this project. Once you establish that connection, now this is investable. You go to the project and say, hey, are we willing to sell some of the future value of this company that's going to flow back to your project to an investor today to get money today to build it further? And they go, yeah. You sort of micro-capitalize. You pico-capitalize every project and do it without, you know, kind of in one with a bunch of SPVs inside of a larger parent company. Anyway, that's the Faro SS idea. It's an investment idea that I've, I, I know. We've done some testing in it, the idea. It would work. Actually, Agreed. Yeah. It does. It, it does. It actually is a nice little feedback loop. Again, I'm, I'm a big fan of people, and, I, and markets are people. Like, I, I'm not a fan of corrupt crony capitalism, and I know that we've got a system today that has a lot of corruption in it. Uh, it's not typically where you think it is, but there are some places where it lives. And I, I'm, I'm a, a, a fan, though, of transparent people coming together to solve problems. And to me, markets are that, uh, fundamentally, and some fantastic innovation that's happened in that. A lot of misunderstanding about it, unfortunately. We, like, people don't know important concepts. They should be learning in eighth grade or fifth grade or sixth grade. They don't have it. But I love like, learning that. And I said, oh, this idea came to me about three years ago. It's why I started a hedge fund, or not a, a private equity fund and a venture fund, basically. We've experimented with it. We've got some companies to commit to it. I just, it, unfortunately, it's one of those things that requires a consistent investment over a period of 10 years. So I've got it, that's what the five million would do, is 500,000 for 10 years. Like enough, a long enough time that you can make it work, because it's not something that will happen in a, a day or a week or a month or, basically it's doing this over 10 years, I know we could change it, I know we could solve the problem. But that's what I need, and I don't have that yet. I don't have five million that I can put into it yet. Somebody does, and you want to change the world, <laughs> come talk, man, I'm happy to, let's, let's make it work, let's make it happen. Awesome. Well. Uh... We'll go ahead and uh, we're here at the top of the hour, so we're going to kick off here in person the uh, happy hour. I believe we'll be going until uh, 7.30 here. Um, and you know, thank you for everyone who came out, you know, attended today, uh, whether in person or virtually. Uh, appreciate you all making it out. And uh, thanks, Travis, for being here. You bet. Pleasure. Thank you.